everyone, welcome back to my channel. I am so excited because the video I get the most questions on is my sleep training video. And I feel like I'm at a point where I can't answer all the questions because I'm not the expert. Natalie is! So Natalie is my sleep trainer. She is Natalie Willis, babysleeptrainer.com. She is the person I hired to help me uh, sleep train Nikosh and it really it changed my life um, We have so many questions from you guys that this is gonna be a long video So what we're gonna do is we are going to list the questions in the description box below and give you the time code That way you can skip to the question and answer that fits to you or you can just watch the entire video because I actually feel like you have so much information that you might be interested in all of it. So you can choose to watch the entire video or skip to the time codes in the description box. So I think the thing we start with is kind of what you do. So I work with families all over the world. In mm -hmm. fact, many families have come to me all over the world from your videos, which is incredible. Yeah. Um, I usually work with them one-on-one, -on -one, so I'll have a consultation. We work together via text and email. But now I also have an online training series, so people uh, can watch videos, communicate with me, learn. So it's a lot of price points, a lot of access for people, but it's mainly me sharing a method with them and then adjusting it for them as we go forward and I see what their child's challenges are. Mm -hmm. So it almost always revolves around an inability to fall asleep unassisted. From that, there'll be a lot of other issues. It's kind of like that's the root and then like all the branches are the individual issues that people will come and ask questions about, yep. but it's often rooted in, in, in an inability to fall asleep unassisted. Got it. And so you have pretty much one method that you teach everybody. So all forms of sleep training are cried out. That's the reality. That's what I tell people. It's I think that a lot of sleep experts like to use euphemisms. They don't like to admit that it's all cried out. But my definition of cried out might be different than others. So sometimes people think uh, cried out is extinction, which is putting them down, not checking on them, coming back in 12 hours. That's not what I ask people to do. Where methods vary is how involved are you? What are you doing? Are you touching them or not? Are you talking to them? Are you staying? All of those things. But the fact of the matter is that you're going to put your child down alone awake in a crib they're going to tell you that they're very upset that you're not doing right. the thing to help you're them. not feeding them to sleep or, or you're whatever. not patting them or exactly. rocking them. so yeah. they're crying and then you check on them however you feel comfortable and then eventually they will figure out how to fall asleep they do that that's why I say all methods are uh, cried out but yes I do have a proprietary method I've developed but there's within it there's a kind of a lot of components that you can vary a lot I guess right there if you guys are opposed to cry it mm -hmm. out um, this video is basically going to be about that. People think there's a way to sleep train their child without that being an element. And what I like to do is just cut through the controversy. Because at the end of the day, whether they're crying for 15 minutes or a few hours or something like that. Cumulatively, you're right, whatever. Yeah, they they are just unhappy because you're making them learn how to do it themselves. And really, that's where it comes down to, right? People who are opposed to cry it out will say, well, you know, your child is crying, wondering if you've abandoned them, which I'm just going to put out there that I don't even know how one would know that a child feels that way. That's a pretty advanced thought, uh, so I don't know how you would even be able to measure something like that, but it's pretty straightforward. I mean, they don't know how to fall asleep on their own. They're very upset. They're telling you they're upset. Uh, and then they eventually do figure out how to give in to the feeling of falling asleep, and then they do it on their own. Got it. Yep. I think the overwhelming question I got were from people who, I mean, their babies were just too young. You mm -hmm. say four months is probably ideal, mm -hmm. but what if they just can't handle it anymore? You're a new mom, you have probably, I mean, this is like rocking a world if it's your first child. Sometimes you've had a really great easy go with your first child, your second, you're like, why what? is this? I yeah. can't sleep, right? It, it is absolutely like, um, can be just nerve wracking and really, really challenging. And I want to, I understand that that is how uh, mothers of newborns feel. Um, I eventually created a program for that that doesn't have any follow-up support because there is no like, but my baby's doing this, like what can I do to change them? There are a number of things that you can do to encourage your child to sleep longer. They're covered in the book or the program or whatever. Um, one of the good ones that I will tell you here that can be beneficial for almost everyone is if you have a child between zero to 16 weeks of age, let's say from whatever you consider their 12 hour daytime period to be, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. for example, if they're napping, don't let them nap for longer than two hours at a stretch. One of the biggest things people do is let, and the whole don't wake a sleeping baby thing is false. They'll let them sleep however long they want because they're, they're glad they're finally sleeping. Newborns have like one stretch of four to five hours in their system in a 24 hour period. That's it. That's what you should assume. 
So don't let them do that from noon to five. Yep. So you can clean the house and take a shower as tempting as it is. Wake them up every two hours, even if they're up for 30 to 60 minutes. Um, there's a lot of other things, honestly, that you can do as well, but that one is gonna be like one of the key things that families don't know about. If they can just do that, get them all the way up, especially if they can expose them to direct sunlight, yep. let them be up for 30 to 60 minutes and put them down again, that's gonna help them have longer stretches of sleep overnight. That makes sense, they're newborns. They're not like cognitively capable of doing the things, like it's not impossible for a newborn to know how to put themselves to sleep on their own, but it's such a tall order and it's so emotionally difficult and some babies actually can't, they don't have the, the biology is not like flowing. It's kind of like why you can't, some eight week old babies could technically, I guess, maybe go 10 to 12 hours overnight without eating. I suppose it's possible, but it's definitely not an assumption you make for all newborns. Like some right. newborns just aren't ready to regulate their blood sugar and they need frequent feedings to regulate their insulin so that they don't, you know, that's how sleep is. That's why you can't expect a whole lot out of a newborn. I think we should get into the questions I because love that. it's starting to actually lead into some of the totally. questions. So I, let's do I it. want to address them. So let's go with question number one. All right. So, first question is from Mira's Muse. She okay. says, I'm so excited. My baby is three months old. Okay, so that's number one, okay. three months old. Um, what if he knows how to put himself to sleep with a pacifier already? Should I stop it or is he at a good phase? Okay, so first of all, a child is not putting themselves to sleep unless they are going down in their crib with their eyes open, not swaddled, no pacifier, no Merlin, no Docotat, nothing else, just a flat, empty crib. Mm -hmm. eyes wide open and able to go from that state to going to sleep without any intervention from any objects or any person. Right. I don't, I go to sleep, I lay down, I close my eyes, I eventually fall asleep. Right. So that's essentially what we're trying to get them to, yes. right? Yes. And the other big difference here is that like, if you have a child that's say 12 months old yeah. and they use a pacifier and then you sleep train them mm -hmm. and that child, you can put them down and put their pacifier eight inches away and they know how to find it and put it in on their own, then it's okay. Oh really? Right, because then you are not the person that they are dependent on to give them that object. There are other reasons that I will not go into right now for mm -hmm. why I think it's wise to stop using a pacifier with your pediatrician's approval when you start training. That is not this question. Right. Now, in her question, I would say it's completely developmentally appropriate for a child under the age of four months to use and rely on a pacifier, especially if this woman finds that it's, or the, I'm assuming she's a woman, this woman finds that it's helping her family. Um, I think there's many safety reasons um, that you would want to keep using a pacifier. She asked, I believe, as a follow-up, like, should I stop? The answer is no. Like, you shouldn't do anything. People will often get into this idea, somebody wrote a book at some point, I don't know who they are, and I wish yeah. I could. And there are so many books. I know, but I wish I could kind of just give them a little shake because they're like, well, you gotta prevent all these bad habits, which is like not possible. You, they, they just are are humans they come out they become reliant on you yeah and that's just it and then you just have to break that it's kind of like training wheels right it's, you're not creating a bad habit by giving a child training a wheels pacifier, right. that's developmentally appropriate it's just are they sleep trained no would you want to stop using it when they sleep train yes yeah um, but she doesn't have to stop right now right because the baby is three months old yeah and, and she's not sleep training yet if she's not if she doesn't want to sleep train at all keep using the passy if she doesn't want to sleep train till six months use it till six months right that leads me to a, a, like a follow-up question mm -hmm. for that though, and that's, um, do you think she's gonna have to eventually sleep train? So I have a pretty skewed perspective because all I do all day long is talk to people who have sleep problems, um, but I would say a majority, probably at some point, babies either grow out of it or need to know how to fall asleep on their own. Right, and then I think that leads us actually to the next question, and the next question is basically, what age is appropriate mm -hmm. to sleep train? So this is another thing you're gonna hear, like a huge amount of different opinions. So the first thing that you wanna make sure is whatever you decide to do, whether you listen to me about what I'm gonna tell you or you use another expert or whatever, make sure your pediatrician is on board with what you're doing. Got it. Doesn't matter if I tell you it's four months, if your doctor says six or eight or nine, that's the opinion that you need to go with. So first and foremost, in my opinion, um, the earliest age you would wanna actually pursue any kind of formal sleep training plan, again, whatever you method you wanna use, I wouldn't do it before 16 weeks counting from your child's estimated due date. So if they were a week early, two weeks, they're twins, even if twins at 38 weeks, even though that's full term for twins, I want them to wait till 40 plus 16 because there are studies that show uh, like melatonin output regulates at that age. It's a lot easier to put your child into the schedule necessary for them to sleep oh. well at night if their hormones are doing what they are developmentally should be doing. Um, I don't think there's any reason to start at 16 weeks. I mean, there's no rush. It's when you feel ready and you need to start. If you don't have a problem, don't do anything. You're right. not helping your child by doing it earlier arbitrarily. That makes sense, that makes sense. Um, you know, another question that someone gave me was, um, if their child is just learning to roll over, like around that four, mm -hmm. four month mark, mm -hmm. I think they get really scared, you know, that they gotta like really watch their child mm -hmm. when they roll over on their tummies. Mm -hmm. Can you sleep train? Okay, so one of the standard questions I have every family, if I, I say, can your child roll over? What direction? Easily? 
If they can't easily roll over both directions, I say, you cannot start sleep training until you ask your doctor, what should I do when my child rolls to their stomach while they're trying to fall asleep or during sleep? So not my, my question to answer. Um, is a child, 98% of the time the pediatrician says, just leave them there, don't roll them back over. Sometimes they say, yes, roll them back over, but don't go crazy. Like if you wake up and you happen to notice, sure, flip them back to their back, but you know, don't stress that. Some of them will say no every single time, no matter how many hours. So it's a good question for your doctor, but um, they are, they are able to sleep just because they roll to their stomach doesn't keep them from being able to do that. Frankly, most babies sleep better on their stomach. They're just angry and frustrated at first because they're like not able to figure out how to get back over. But again, it's that frustration and anger that drives them to like uh, continue the milestone. So it's that frustration and anger that makes them figure out like how to manipulate their body in a way to get themselves back into the position that they wanna be in. And I do wanna say one more thing. It's a question nobody asked, but it's one I know people are thinking, they're just not admitting. Um, so a lot of families, a lot of mothers choose to put their children to sleep on their stomachs. They know they're doing something that's like totally wrong. They don't tell anybody. Right, they don't talk about it. Oh yeah, but you know why? Because they know that their baby sleeps better on their stomach, so they're doing it. You shouldn't do that, but that's what they're doing. So a lot of families will come to me and sleep train and they'll be like, well, I don't, I, I don't care. I don't care what my doctor says. Like, I'm just gonna keep doing it. You know why you don't wanna do that? Because sleeping on their stomach, it's also an assistive device to sleep. Oh, what? Because if you put them on their stomach and they figure out how to flip to their back and they don't know how to get to their stomach on their own, who do you think has to roll them back to their stomach? Mom. Exactly. Dad. So you always start your child out on their back. Even if they, even if your doctor said they can sleep on their stomach, if they get there on their own, train them to sleep starting on their back. So the next question is from Ning Knows Best, and actually we got a couple of these like rapid extinction sleep training questions. Okay. So she says they did rapid, rapid, rapid extinction sleep training, and now they're not sure what to do if she cries in the middle of the night or in the morning. Should she rush in? Should she wait? Assess it. How long? Sometimes she goes back to sleep, but not always. I feel so guilty listening to her cry. Right. Okay. So I'm making an assess, or I should say an assumption here. Rapid extinction is probably something to the effect of like, go down, don't go back in unless you think there's an emergency all night long. Repeat, repeat, repeat. The method is fine to use if that's something you feel comfortable with and you're successful with. However, one issue families you run into a lot is like, wait, but they're not going to like always be silent all night. And like, I don't actually, you know, if you do another method, like the baby sleep trainer method, which is mine, you already have checks built in. So any time where you don't know what to do, you're like, well, I remember I, you know, go this many minutes and I wait for this or whatever. She doesn't have those tools, right? That oh, because rapid extinction means they're not going back. Exactly. Unless they really think uh, something is wrong, there's no checks at all, is my assumption of based Like on besides her monitoring, you mean like, like on a monitor? Correct. Like, like, they're just not going into the room. They're anymore. not doing checks every, you know, 10 minutes. They're not talking, touching, they're not doing anything like that. They're just staying out of the room, which is a method to use. And there's nothing wrong with using that method, but it does leave a lot of question because your child is gonna cry. So it's a very difficult thing because you have to assess personally what's happening with your child. My general rule of thumb is that anytime for any reason, if you think something is wrong, you should go in immediately, right? Right. Even if your child is sleep trained, even if you're in the middle of sleep training, even if you're in the middle, middle, like I'm in the middle of a check and it's supposed to be 10 minutes and it's five, like you're, if your gut tells you, your moms have like good gut instinct, right? You know, and the thing is, well, that, that and a lot of the times there's nothing wrong, but you have to learn that when you hear that cry, actually it doesn't necessarily mean something's wrong. So next time it happens, you're like, I've heard this, I know what this cry means, but children, they're not vases. You're not gonna be in the right. middle of sleep training, you know, drop the vase, it breaks and you can never put it back together. It's not like if she checks one time, all of her sleep training goes out the window. Right. So I would say, if she thinks something might be wrong, to go in right away. If she's not sure, I think it's reasonable to wait three, five, seven, ten minutes. One thing she might want to keep in mind, this is I think gonna be a really helpful tip for people, is if you're in a situation like this, regardless of whether you've done rapid extinction or not, if your child is having pauses, five, 10, 15 second pauses and they're crying, even if it's quite a while, that's a good sign that they're, and especially if they're sleep trained, that they're trying to get back to sleep. So giving them a second, um, you know, if it's gone on for 10, 15, 20 minutes, probably a good idea to go in there, make sure nothing's wrong. But once you've identified that even, just it, those pauses are really indicative that they're trying to get back to sleep. The first, I wanna say like couple of weeks of doing the sleep training, um, when he would cry, I wasn't sure what was happening. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I did eventually start to pick up on like, this is a, a really like something is happening. Like maybe he did like have a poopy right um, mm -hmm. in the middle of the night because I can tell he's much more. It's like a different kind of cry right. um, than like a almost like a, a I hate to call it a fake cry, but like a or whining or like just a, like yeah. I'm frustrated. Like I'm mad at you versus something's wrong. Can we also just say that sometimes something will be wrong and it's not going to be something you're going to be able to fix? Right. Sometimes a car is going to go by. It's going to wake them up. They're going to be they're mad. super pissed. Yep. And then you're gonna go in there and then they're like, I'm mad. And you're like, I'm sorry. 
sorry. And then you were like, but I can't help you. Yeah, it's true. So, you know, it's true. I mean, sometimes something's wrong. So you, you always go in if you're not sure. So the next question I'm not even going to read because okay. there's a few people that basically ask this. And I feel like it's similar. Mm -hmm. So one person was asking like, you know, my baby's, what, what do you do when your baby is sleep trained, but they're going through a sleep regression or mm -hmm. my baby is teething now. What do I do? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going to answer this question like almost verbatim how I tell every client I work with in every consultation, probably even how I answer it in my online training series because it's such a common issue. You should expect your child to have a sleep issue, especially overnight, every four to six weeks. So something wow. should happen, something, teething illness, whatever. Something is going to happen to disrupt their sleep. Regardless of what is happening, your plan should always be exactly the same, which actually uh, we were just talking about another question that's going to sound very similar to the answer that I gave to that. Uh, you want to immediately go in mm -hmm. and assess what is wrong. If you can identify what is wrong, address what is wrong. If there's something that you need to do to assist your child, let's say their leg is caught above a joint, they can't get it out of this uh, uh, crib slat. Let's say that you are touching in their mouth, you feel the tooth coming out. Right, and they're reacting, so you're like, oh, I think that's it. You've, they're vomiting, they have a fever, they have a rash, they have a, it's, uh, you pick them up and they don't stop crying and they're really scared. Maybe they've had a nightmare, right? So you immediately can sense, like, identify what's wrong. If you can identify the cause, identify, or rather, address that cause immediately. Unless your doctor tells you differently, there is never a time that your child needs you to help them fall asleep. Interesting. They don't, and that's, if, if parents could adopt that, you would do everything you can. Yeah. Sometimes you're gonna go in and you don't know what's wrong. Wait, I'm gonna be the mom. Oh, sure. <laughs> I'm gonna be the mom who's okay. gonna fight you on this, right? Because mm -hmm. this happens, right? Sure, I mean, and I, this is helpful. So I wanna hear the yeah. sort of personal so, thoughts about it. I guess I, I think back on some of the sleep regressions and I, I probably messed up and I think I messed up in those sleep regressions because if he was sick, for instance, I was patting him mm -hmm. and I didn't realize he's now falling asleep. Mm -hmm. So then I'd look down and he'd be passed out, mm -hmm. basically, and, I'd, and so I messed up. Right, and so like if you're very <clears throat> conscious about not doing that, and again, it is like an awareness and a conscious, so this can basically take two paths. Is it realistic that like you're never gonna help your child fall asleep during illness? Probably not. Like they're gonna fall asleep on you, or maybe you'll do it purposely, or maybe there'll be a moment of yeah, weakness. Yeah, because sometimes there's like, and I'm sometimes not, it's, 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 right. it's very uh, selfish too. You're and like, I'm not gonna call it weakness. You're gonna make a call, whatever. You make that choice. You can always sleep train them again instantly, right? The next day, the next evening, whatever. But if you don't want to do that, Right. Then if you don't want to have to keep training them over and the older they get, the harder it is, the more yep. trauma, it, it gets, there are more and more challenges, right? Yep. Really, if you never want to sleep train again, all you have to do is not assist them to sleep. So when you've given them the Advil, you've waited till 2 a.m., you know their fever is broken, yep. you've addressed everything, maybe you've given them a bath, you've cooled them down, and you put them down and they're like, but I don't want you to go. You're going to be like, but you still have to fall asleep on your own. And you can room share, you can wait outside, you can watch them on the monitor, you can be in the room with them, but it's the act of falling asleep independently, which I, I, is the first thing I said, it always comes back to that. Because then, once the illness has passed, the child's like, well, I was never helped to sleep, so now we go back. So it, Makes sense. it's the reality of what often happens, and then like kind of technically what you wanna do. So teething, regressions, wonder weeks, anything that anyone wants to say, anything, any reason your child's not sleeping, you deal with it exactly the same way heard it. Okay, the next question, um, I'm going to butcher this, but it's from Adit, Aditi Jambagi, and she says, pretty good. Yeah, right? I pretty, think that's pretty, pretty good. Um, how to sleep train an exclusively breastfed baby? And you know what? I got other questions like this. Mm -hmm. I think women get worried. I personally was worried about this, and I asked you about it, mm -hmm. I think. Um, when you're breastfeeding, especially if you breastfeed through the night, mm -hmm. you're producing more milk. Mm -hmm. And so you worry that if you stop suddenly feeding your child mm -hmm. in the night, then you're not gonna produce milk. Mm -hmm. So what do you think? Okay, so there's a couple of things and I feel like everything I tell you has like a super long answer. Hopefully people will appreciate all the information. So uh, if you have a child that is going 12 hours overnight with that eating, let's say you're uh, sleep training an eight month old, your doctor said no feeds overnight. Okay, you know, you can go seven to seven. If you've been nursing, let's say three or four times a night, that'd be maybe on the high side, maybe more, but let's say that's average, right? So you never wanna stop more than one nursing session a week, right? That's kind of like a good, and you would back, you check that that's right with your medical provider or whatever, right? So I would say, okay, mom, you should be pumping every night before you go to bed at 10 o'clock. You should actually do that. Anyone who sleep trained, whose kid goes 12 hours overnight, you should pump religiously at 10 p.m. or whenever you go to bed every night until you're ready to start like weaning your child. So that alone, especially if they're waking up at six or seven, for most women, that's gonna be okay for their supply. If you're concerned that it isn't, 
then you can also pump at three o'clock in the morning. But I would say that as long as we're eating every two and a half to three and a half hours during the day, nursing that frequently throughout the day, it's a really big myth that you can't sleep train successfully while nursing. So a, a typical, let's say if your baby takes six months old and takes three naps, this is a typical pattern. You'll get up at seven, they'll nurse, they'll take a nap at say at 8.30, get up at 9.30, nurse again. They'll take a nap at 11.30, get up at 12.30, oh, and nurse again, right? And they're doing this, it's eating, going to sleep all day long, eat, wake, sleep cycle, because then they're awake, they haven't eaten for three hours, and they're hungry, and they're taking right. a substantial feeding. Um, and so it doesn't affect that many women's supply, but you do have to be really conscientious and watchful and use the pump when you need to. Sleep training doesn't mean that your 16-week-old baby has to stop eating overnight. Okay. So I have, a, if my client's pediatrician says, well, they need to have two feedings a night. Cool, I have a, I'm working with a client right now, around 16 weeks, two feedings, great, I don't care. Sleeping and eating have almost nothing to do with one another. Oh. Yeah, people, that's a huge myth. They're like, well, if they just would eat more during the day, they'd sleep at night. Children usually don't wake out of hunger at night, like starting pretty early on, like four or five months. It's not exclusively hunger that's waking them. You're addressing their waking with a feeding, so then they are getting accustomed to eating. They have a lower appetite during the day because they're eating so much overnight. If you drank two ounces of whole milk every time your baby got up to nurse, you wouldn't be hungry during the day either, right? Right, I wouldn't wake up hungry, that's for sure. Uh, right, and so they haven't been waking up exclusively out of hunger for quite, quite a while in most cases. And another thing that's extremely important, same, I really wanna say this actually, that working with the same client, using a baby scale. If you have an exclusively breastfed baby, especially one that has not started solids yet or isn't great at solids, get a scale. And if you're concerned at all about it, every single day, same time, naked, maybe when they're changing their diaper, weigh them and just write it down once a day. And you will very soon know whether you have a supply issue or not. Because if that kid's not growing a half ounce or three quarters of an ounce every day, over a week period, we have a problem. And then right. you add another two, one or two feedings at night, you figure out, but don't assume that you can't do it just because you're breastfeeding. That makes sense. So the big mm -hmm. big takeaway is pump is your friend. Mm -hmm. If you feel like you need to. Watch their weight, pump. like weigh it at home. Watch their weight. Mm -hmm. And um, and we don't wake up in the middle of the night to eat, so they probably don't Checking need to with either. your pediatrician, this yeah. is a really like, you need, your doctor needs to tell you, do they need a feeding, do they, do they not? But don't think that you can't sleep train and breastfeed because you totally can. So um, Alex is asking if you, if the baby is actually drinking like the entire amount of like the bottle mm -hmm. that they feed mm -hmm. um, during the dream feed, mm -hmm. does that mean the baby needs it? Yeah, so let's really quickly define what a dream feed is because okay. everyone has a different definition and I need to define what my definition is first before I answer this question. Smart, like so it. a dream feed is walking into a room where a child is completely asleep, walking over to them, picking them up, or perhaps in the case if they're having a bottle, going into the crib and like dropping them up, putting the bottle in their mouth or nursing them. Mm -hmm. Their eyes remain closed the entire time and they never wake up. Oh, interesting. Mo okay. Most of the time when people say dream feed, they actually just mean feeding. Like their baby is getting up, crying, they're feeding them in response, and then they're falling asleep while Like eating. late at night. Or any time that that child is asleep. I guess theoretically a parent would cons could consider a dream feed to be any time. Got it. So, uh, regardless of whether this feeding is a true dream feed or just a night feed, either way, yep. again, you need to ask your pediatrician, is my child biologically capable of going 12 hours overnight without eating? Do they medic? Is it medically necessary for them to have a feeding overnight, right? And even if the child is relying on those calories at night, if they are withheld, they'll just their body will just ask for the calories during the day. That they'll makes just sense. Eat more. Yep. This is a delicate topic to talk about because feedings are technically medical advice, and while sleep coaches end up talking to them about them, you really need to make sure that you have a good relationship with your pediatrician right. and you're identifying your own individual child's needs. And again. You don't have to stop nursing them or feeding them overnight in order to successfully train them. All sleep training is, is a child knowing how to fall asleep on their own. Right. If they know how to fall asleep on their own, but they actually need to eat, cool, great, no problem. They that don't need sense. to actually cut out all feedings overnight. Yeah. And I, I like that you keep pointing out the relationship with the pediatrician, yes. because you even said this to me, like like you even, after our like initial consultation, mm -hmm. you were like, these are the things you need to check with your yep. pediatrician before we get started. Oh yeah, I, I think it is like extremely irresponsible for sleep coaches to do all of these things with babies and not have them talk to their doctors. They are trained to look for things that are very concerning that you might not even know. So I'm not gonna tell you that your child definitively can do this or that. It's just really irresponsible on my part. Right. So I always, I mean, I don't think there's a single client I work with that, that I tell them not to talk to their doctor about something at some point. So I think a big one that I feel like I got questions about were um, people who are co-sleeping mm -hmm. and they wanted to know 
if they're able to like sleep train while mm -hmm. co-sleeping. Great, okay, so there are two questions there. Uh, is there a way or how do you transition away from co-sleeping? And then also, how do you sleep train while co-sleeping? Right. Okay, so first of all, any form of assistance that your child gets, whether they, all you have to do is put a passy in their mouth or you have to side lie and nurse them nonstop with your nipple in their mouth all night long, exactly the same. Okay. There's no type of assistance you give your child that is harder to break away from than anything else. Right. So when people are asking, how do I stop co-sleeping? It's the same question as, well, I, didn't, I rock my child to sleep. How do I stop that? Okay. So whatever method a parent identifies that they feel comfortable with, again, whether it's mine or someone else's, that method should be the same regardless of whatever assistance that child is transitioning right. away from. I think a lot of times what parents are asking is how do I transition away from co-sleeping without them crying or without them being upset about it? That's not gonna happen. Your child is entitled to express their feelings. You would not have your five-year-old get off the school bus coming home and say, I really am frustrated because so-and-so did this to me and you say, ah, I can't hear your feelings. It's really difficult for me to hear how you feel. That's how you approach like them expressing themselves. So you can't transition away from co-sleeping E more easily, but it's the exact same process and the exact same amount of crying that for that child, had they been co or had they been co-sleeping, or were you, if you were breaking them away from another habit that right. they had. You got to think of them crying when you're sleep training them as them just expressing their feelings. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. and that's really where the opinion is going to come down to. And some people, many many of your viewers are going to flat out disagree with me. That's yeah. okay. I'm, I had people. So and really and it's all and it's you know and that's you. people are entitled to disagree and that's okay because yep. we're all doing but my opinion i've worked with over four thousand families at this point Woo! i mean i have thousands i can't even tell you how many thousands of hours i've done this i i can safely say i am pretty sure there's almost no one on this planet that knows more about the subject than i do because i have done it closely with people moms all day every day for years so people can have their opinions but that's where mine's coming from and they're crying because they're frustrated it makes sense to yeah. me. And your you know, babies have good outcomes. As far as I want, do you want to touch on the subject of how to successfully uh, sleep train while co-sleeping? So yeah. it's kind of an uh, oxymoron because co-sleeping means that they're reliant on you in order to go to sleep. We've touched many times on the fact that uh, co-sleeping is an assistive device essentially for your child. However, there is technically a method that you can use if you are insistent on continuing to co-sleep. It sounds pretty terrible to me, but you can do it. And it literally involves taking your child, let's say that this is your baby, okay? okay. I'm just gonna use this This is my toy. dog's toy. Okay, it's very cute, okay? And they're, let's say they nurse all night long, nurse. You are, the method is truly to physically hold them away from their, your body, and basically hold them down, and let them cry next to you. Because by the way, it's still cried out, they're just with you. It's probably worse because they're with you because they cannot understand why, but regardless, then they eventually realize I'm not gonna nurse. Right. So mom's not giving in. So you're actually not co-sleeping or rather sleep training. You're just teaching them how to sleep depending on your physical body instead of depending on nursing, which is what some people wanna do. Perhaps they wanna continue to have a family bed. Possible, still requires cried out. Another one that I feel like I got a ton of the same question essentially mm -hmm. uh, for is, um, some people share rooms, mm -hmm. whether they're in an apartment and they only have one bedroom mm -hmm. or they are still in like transition or something, sure. they have a bassinet only, yep. something like that. So they want to sleep train, but they have the same room. Can mm -hmm. we do it? The American Academy of Pediatrics now recommends that you room share at a minimum to six months or uh, to a year, ideally, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so anytime a parent chooses not to follow that guideline, this is a question I have them ask their doctor. You cannot expect your child to not express their desire at being with you if you're in the same room with them. So you can successfully train them, but you should expect them to have a lot more disrupted sleep. The reason that the recommendation exists to room share is because sh children sleep more lightly. Uh. There are ways to room share, actually, if you wish that you could put them in their own room, you just can't, which yeah. is different than like, I'm choosing to room share. Um, Ikea sells this really great device. Uh, unfortunately, I can't pronounce it, but it's basically a curtain wire, and if you Google that, and you can create like a wired off area with curtains anywhere you'd like. So you can still put them in their own space, cover them with like thick curtain panels, put in a white noise machine, it's really dark. They'll often be able to, to sleep well that way. Defeats the purpose of the room sharing safety. Do not, do not ever put your child to sleep in their own room without your pediatrician's approval if they're not 12 months old. Got it, so you're essentially doing a partition. Yes, but it's you want to do it like floor to ceiling, heavy panels, white noise, darkness. You're basically just mimicking the a bedroom. Yeah, exactly. Got it. In your own room. That mm -hmm. makes sense. The few times after we had sleep trained Nikosh, we did go, you know, like we traveled mm -hmm. and took him with us, but we room shared then. Mm -hmm. And I noticed probably around like eight months, nine months, when at the at the point where he could actually like stand oh, up mm -hmm. in the crib, that was when it became a problem because mm -hmm. he would wake up in the middle of the night and then he'd look over and he'd be like, 
wait a second. Mm -hmm. And he'd stand up and it wouldn't be crying or anything. It'd be like, hey, what's up, guys? That's like right. that kind of an attitude. Totally. But kids are like that. Like if they wake up, they're like, let's just party, right? Like, yeah. I mean, I'm, I don't know what time it is, so we're just going to hang, right? So, I mean, I don't know how you would expect your child yeah. to be willing to go back to sleep if the most important person in the entire world to them is within, you know, three feet of them and they see you. It makes sense. Yeah. That actually leads to another uh, viewer question. And that question was, uh, they, they co-sleep mm -hmm. um, and the baby wakes up in the middle of the night mm -hmm. and starts to get chatty. Mm -hmm. Do I mean, I don't blame pain? them. I, it, it depends on what that family wants as an outcome. If they would like the child to sleep through the night and you know, then yes, they need to put them in their own space or else they will always demand their attention. So again, a, another one that I feel like I got more than one question mm -hmm. about was what if my baby has reflux. Mm -hmm. You know, we hear about like the babies that are colicky and all that kind of stuff. Are mm -hmm. they, are you able to sleep train them and how do you do it? Yeah. So over 50% uh, I think of all infants suffer from reflux. Super, super common. Um, families address it a variety of different ways. Pediatricians address it a variety of different ways. Um, generally speaking, we're going to talk about whether they're medicated or whether they're not medicated and how far along they are and how severe it is, right? Mm -hmm. Once again, that issue does not preclude a child from being able to fall asleep independently. Uh, the things that complicate reflux are what if you uh, feed your child right before you put them down, they're flat, and then they spit up. What's really interesting is a good sleep training method, and I'm really not just plugging mine here, but I, I can only speak to the one that I've created. A really good sleep training method is going to make parents do a lot of things that are very counterintuitive, but that are going to reduce the crying. So if you're doing a good method, then even if your child has reflux and even if you think their crying is going to trigger them to spit up, mm -hmm. it's much less likely to happen if you're using a good method. So people, mm -hmm. things people are doing that they don't realize they're not doing well, or it's what's triggering the like, <gasps> and the freak out and the, and the spitting up. I will also say my own pediatrician and others of my clients have told me, you know, if your child has reflux, that is all the more reason you want to sleep train them. Their esophagus never gets a break. If you're nursing them all night long, it's just constant acid up and down and they're relying on the nursing and they're soothing and all the whole thing that goes along with it. So cutting those feedings out, if your pediatrician approves it early, is super beneficial it for them. It makes sense. There can be other issues in terms of like, um, you know, if you do that and then they want bigger, more frequent feeds during the day, it can get more complicated, but once again, does not preclude a child from being able to fall asleep independently and put themselves back to sleep throughout the night when they wake up. Makes sense. Completely. Mm -hmm. Got it. All right, so this one I think it's a, it's, I think essentially what she's saying, this is Lucy Bang. She says, my once sleep trained baby, now 10 months, used to sleep 6 to 6, then 6 30 to 6 30, now it's a whole different thing. So she essentially wants to go back to that old schedule. She mm -hmm. wants to make sure her baby can stay on the exact schedule she wants, 6 30 to 6 30. Mm -hmm. Is that possible? Okay, so. Um, this is an answer that is only going to apply to people who have sleep trained and sleep trained the way that it's clear that I believe children need to be sleep trained, which means they're totally independent. So if you have a child that is completely sleep trained and you want them to start their day at the same time, there is only one person that determines what time they get out of bed each morning and that's a parent or a right. caregiver. So if you want your child to get up at 6.30, then they just need to get up at 6.30. Clearly they're gonna wake up when they wanna wake up. It is incredibly difficult for infants to sleep soundly from four to 7 a.m. This is a common issue. This is something I talk about in my consult. It's in my book, it's in my series. It's really, really common. Like the way to resolve that is to set a firm start time of the day regardless of when they wake because they're not robots. They're not gonna wake up the same time every day. Right. Um, and typically entering and interacting with them prior to that time perpetuates the problem. You're essentially just being like, I'm not gonna get you until 6.30, so. That's when she wants to start And they just gotta get used to it. That's right. You know, another question that seemed like a common one, and I'm getting from friends now that I like tell them that sleep training changed our lives. Uh -huh. um, my boy, this is uh, Mochiism. She says, my boy's 14 months now. Is it too late to sleep train? He still wakes up two to three times for milk. Woo, that's, I'd be so exhausted. That's right, yeah, and she's been doing it probably for a while. So there is no too late to sleep train. I work with kids till they're like three and a half or four years old. There is a tricky time to sleep train when they are climbing out of their crib. Things become a lot more challenging um, for reasons again we don't need to address now but so if we're talking about like ideal time I would say 16 weeks of age uh, or older counting from the due date up until the age when they can be climbing out so the reason this woman I don't know if you're watching but the reason I would suggest that you address this issue ASAP is because if your child hits a milestone where they can climb out then you can sleep train them but it's very crude and nothing anybody really wants to do and basically involves like 
shutting the door and like running away like and letting, locking yes it, and right? it's not even something i will work with my clients to do i just tell them this is essentially your choice and you can do it and talk to your doctor or not because i won't do it with you you know another question and it's actually one i'm going to be in soon mm -hmm. is uh, so this is this is actually selfish this is mine how do you transition from crib to bed and and what's the appropriate age yes so you want to like delay this as long as humanly possible truly I do not care if you are having another child and you don't want two babies in cribs or you think you need that other crib, you don't need to do that. Like I personally offer to buy my clients like cribs from Ikea when they ask me, but I need it and they're like two and I just want them. No, I will buy you a crib. Do not transition them just because. So ideally you would only transition them if they um, are, I would say like at a minimum two and a half years old or older or because they're climbing out of their crib. So climbing out of their crib is a no-brainer. They have to be in their, they have to be in a bed. Um, assuming they are two and a half years or older, there is a really great method outlined in the book um, on how to do it. And the thing that you want to keep in mind is a lot of families will read like, well, it's just like buy, you know, sheets that they like, and yep. then we're gonna like make them so excited. And a lot of babies, or uh, toddlers rather, will be like, okay, this is cool. And they just like don't really do anything and stay in the room, sometimes weeks. Then, then they realize that they can come and go as they please, and all of a sudden they like appear next to you at like 3 a.m. like breathing and staring. <laughs> I mean, at you. I was that kid. <laughs> totally, we all did it, right? So that's why you're you basically have to. There's an element of turning the bedroom that they sleep in into a crib, even though they're toddlers. Right, like putting like so, gates on the door. Yeah, well, so it, there's a, different methods um, that you can approach in doing it, and um, and there's ways that you can sort of read about. But the idea, the concept, is that if they're old enough to understand, if they're preschoolers essentially or older. You're explaining to them like you this you have to stay here. If you're awake, you're asleep, it doesn't really matter to me, but you need to stay in your room. And if you keep leaving, event here's how we're gonna show you like how many chances you have to leave. And then if you lose all your chances, this is gonna be your consequence. So they are like, well, I don't want the consequence because we don't have currency with toddlers usually, right? Like we, there's not a lot we can take away from them. So often you have to create something to take away from them that they don't want to lose so that then they come, they choose to comply because the idea is a natural consequence and them choosing to be obedient. It's not a great choice to like just beg them. Like it's just, they're not going to do that right. and it's going to get really bad. Right. Really it's so much cooler to just go right. visit mom and dad. And wait, wait as long as you can. Like four years old is not too old to be in a crib. God, it's that's really good not. To know. I don't know where this idea came from that like we need to, that we are like fixated in this country and probably others with transitioning children to beds as if it's like some milestone we should want them to hit. We don't. It like it, it like screws up so many kids sleep when they transition to beds for no reason. There's nothing wrong with leaving them in the crib. You know, this is another question that wasn't asked in these in this set of questions, but I feel like people have actually DM me this a few times, mm -hmm. especially when they see me traveling. Mm -hmm. They ask if we sleep train how do we go about traveling with our toddler or mm -hmm. uh, infant or baby or whoever infant, whatever mm -hmm. yeah how do we travel with our baby mm -hmm. and not mess up their sleep training so you can't prevent these things from happening remember earlier i was talking about how every four to eight weeks or four to six weeks you're going to have a disruption this falls into that category yeah. so basically if at all humanly possible follow the same guidelines you follow at home like i would i remember going to hotels bringing my own pack and play, bringing my white nose machine, so mimic the home environment as much as you can. Hotels are typically pretty dark. Um, sometimes hotels will have bathrooms that you can put the pack and play in. And then I would like put my kid down and then I would just like put the lock into the door and I would shut it and then I would like go to the hallway and stand there with my husband while my child fell asleep. Um, or I'd go on, on the balcony and then I would go back in once they were already asleep, right? Um, or staying in the same room with them, but again, it always comes back to them falling asleep independently. And if you're taking a trip, maybe you're not staying in a hotel, whatever the circumstance may be, Right when you arrive, the fourth, first 24 hours are critical in terms of establishing the expectation that they're gonna fall asleep independently. Mm. A lot of the trips that you take, let's say you go to Hawaii, they're not gonna sleep at, in, they're out, you're, that's the whole point, right? You're traveling, so you're balancing reality, which is your child's gonna be assisted to sleep. Maybe that's the night they choose to completely freak out in the middle of the night, and then you're like, they, I can't, I can't let them cry. They're literally waking everyone up, so you have to assist them to sleep. God forbid you have to bring them into the bed, which is you know the cardinal rule that you don't wanna break. That means you walk through your door, and you're like, what do I do for sleep training? Oh yeah, that's right. And you just walk right to the room and you put them down and they will be upset and frustrated that you are not helping them fall asleep. But once again, if you are very consistent and you should anticipate like when you are planning your trip, the first two days that you get home and what you do not want to do is say, oh, I'm going to wait. Like I'm just going to wait for them. They're jet lagged. Like I'm just going to wait for them to adjust and then I'm going to sleep train. No, as soon as you get home, whatever rules you broke while you were traveling, because we all will do that. Yep. 
um, then just you immediately have to go right back into training. And they should recover usually within two to three days or less. Another viewer asked, um, she sleep trained her baby. Mm -hmm. Baby sleeps perfectly in his crib. Mm -hmm. But then now she's like, well, now we want to live our lives mm -hmm. and we want to be out during the day, like on mm -hmm. a weekend, mm -hmm. but he won't go to sleep for his naps mm -hmm. because now he will only sleep in his crib. Mm -hmm. Anything she can do? No, I mean, I, I think that she has to decide whether her outings are worthwhile in terms of disrupting her child's sleep. Yeah. I don't think it's... I think in a family, mothers in particular, but every member of every family makes sacrifices for the value and the greater you know, whole of the entire family. So sometimes that means the kid's gonna be like pissed off because he's not sleeping. She can't make him or her, I should say, she can't make the baby, maybe it's a girl, sleep better. I can't sleep anywhere that's not my bed. And kids who are like that, I really want to dispel this myth that it's like because sometimes I'm like, well, my cousin, like she's sleep training and now her baby won't sleep anywhere. That's just that baby. like. Some humans only like need their environment to sleep. They'll be the same way the whole, all their upbringing all the way till they're adults. Don't blame sleep training. Be grateful that they have somewhere that they can sleep and just be like, well, sometimes things are not gonna be perfect. And that's like, not everything has a perfect solution. So the final question, this is from Jackie. She says, I'm a breastfeeding mama. Everyone says I shouldn't nurse my baby to sleep, but is it really that bad? I don't mind getting up in the middle of the night. Won't he just transition mm -hmm. and pick up a sleep pattern? Yeah. So there is a theory or a methodology out there called waiting it out. And the idea is that if you wait long enough, your child will adopt more adult-like sleep patterns. This is why, regardless of how we sleep as babies, we end up as adults who typically have, you know, normal sleep patterns. Um, I will tell you that my children are in elementary school and still have peers, I know of them, that uh, require their parents to lay with them until they go to sleep. So there is a potential for poor sleep habits to continue if you don't address them as children. Um, but really the bottom line is no, you shouldn't do anything that you don't want to do. If you don't think you have a problem, then you don't need to address There's anything. So you should only sleep train if you feel like something is wrong. Don't ever sleep train because people are telling you that you should or that you need to do something differently. This is up to you. Like this is this person's child. This and is a personal family It decision. really is. And I think People think sleep coaches are like, well, everyone should sleep train. No, not everyone should sleep train. Like, it's if you're cool with waking up yeah. in the middle of the night. If it works and for your family and yeah. your partner's happy and your family's happy, like, then you should do what you're doing and don't worry about changing anything. I think that's a great mm -hmm. answer. Sleep training is a choice. That's right. It really is. I like it. Well, Natalie, thank you so much, you guys. You can find her everywhere, basically. Social media. Her website is babysleeptrainer.com, mm -hmm. right? That's right. Yep. And Baby Sleep Trainer on Instagram. Yep. Um, find me on Instagram. I'm actually going to do a giveaway with Kite Baby. So if you find me there, it's at Susan Yara. Um, I, uh, I love Kite Baby. They are the sleep sack company that I go with. So I, I love check them. them out. They're really, really great. I'll connect you, actually. Awesome. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you have any questions, comments, anything, tell us below. Subscribe to my channel, and I will talk to you guys soon.